The Titanic carried 3,300 passengers and crew. Nearly half of them lost their lives on the night of April 14, 1912. But the stories of the Titanic live on. On the ship were millionaires, artists, fashionistas, bakers, cookers, musicians, doctors, and con men. These are their stories. Welcome to the Last Night on the Titanic podcast. All right, Veronica, welcome to this series. Thank you, Scott. I'm really looking forward to talking with you about these incredible stories of these amazing survivors and the people who fought for their lives. And I'm so grateful for this opportunity to further their stories. They've just been incredibly inspiring to me, and I hope that they can inspire others. Yeah, we're going to get into a lot of different types of people who are there, people that wouldn't typically think of those who are on the Titanic Bakers, popcorn vendors, writers, trendsetters, millionaires, doctors, even a few swindlers, people who marry rich widows and the like, which you can kind of expect when there's a lot of rich people gathered together in one place, there'll be those there to exploit it. And before we get into the why of why you decided to research this project and what we're going to discuss, what do you think is your absolute favorite Titanic story from everything that you've researched? Wow. I don't know where to begin. I loved every single one of these stories. Each of these stories, Scott, just took me through a journey, an incredible journey and a time for me personally. Hope you don't mind if I get a little personal here. Uh, Okay. I just want to share there was a real purpose to me in researching and writing this book And when I did, I had just gotten started and went to work one day and someone called me and said that my mother had died suddenly at 74. She was in perfect health. It was completely unexpected. Six months later, I was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer. I have never experienced a year quite like the one that I just experienced. And at the same time, you know, with other things happening as well, of course, as we all have, you know, our personal trials and challenges uh, to leave work and go home and, and focus on the book and such a challenging topic, delving into these horrific nightmarish experiences these poor people had and to find a way to truly honor them in the written word and, and now thanks to the podcast to, to uh, telling people about it through uh, the internet. So to do that was such a challenge and I, I found it very challenging. And one day a friend said to me, you know, there, this is no mistake that this happened, that all of this is happening at once. Each person's story that you're delving into is rich with inspiration and they each one of those people that I studied helped me get through what I was going through and to still find the strength to sit down at the computer every night and to go to the library on the weekends and read through probates and go through all of the extensive research that I did. Uh, each one of them were like, each one of those stories were like the wind beneath my wings. But if I had to pick one, one story It's about someone who didn't travel on the Titanic at all, but he mailed a letter from the Titanic. He was super excited to be there seeing off his wife's uncle, and he sent a letter. It was the first letter to be sent from the Titanic, sent it home to his wife, and I think just the act of him doing that really daylights for us the... Um, social significance of this great ship at that time that he was just on board for a little while and he took the time to take Titanic stationery and pin a letter to his wife. And then in stepping off in Southampton before the ship sailed, he in fact survived the Titanic. He was a survivor himself and uh, a horrible circumstance happened to him afterward. Uh, his his uncle that he was seeing off, his wife's uncle, he did survive. 
And in the 1940s, this man, Paul Danby, who wrote the first letter from the Titanic, he was killed at in a, in a Nazi concentration camp. He died at Sobibor. And to me, that Holocaust connection to the Titanic is just sort of a, a collision of sorts of two just magnificent, incredible pieces of our world history. And it's told amazingly in the story of Paul Danby. Yeah, and we'll get to him later. He really has an amazing story. And I wonder, when you were looking at stories like this, what angle were you hoping to look at to have a fresh perspective on the Titanic, since this is something that's been studied laboriously by many people over the years? So the focus was how to extrapolate what originally was a 250-word magazine article in honor of the 100th anniversary in 2012. And it was the focus was on wines and cocktails and how to turn that into a book. So the, the people that I decided to look at were the people who had ties to food In the case of Paul Danby, for example, the man we just spoke about, his uncle was included in the book because he wrote a letter home to his wife detailing the divine lunch that he had had on that first day on board the Titanic. And he talked about the draft Munich lager that was on board uh, by the company Wrexham Lager, Wrexham Brewing Company. Um, And those were the people, for the most part, who we really put under a microscope and looked at uh, the details of their life. Who were these people? Because there were so many incredible people. How do you define which ones to look at? So we looked at those who had ties to the food, people who had tucked away a menu and managed to uh, carry it with them onto the Carpathia, which rescued survivors of the Titanic in the wee hours of um, Sunday or Monday morning, April 15th. We looked at people who had um, jobs in any kind of food-related activities uh, and even off the ship, like Popcorn Dan, the gentleman from the area where I grew up, Merrill, Wisconsin, he operated a popcorn cart on Main Street at home, not on the on the. Um, Titanic, but at home he did. So we kind of found a way to, as I said earlier, to extrapolate and look closely at who were these people? Because so much of what we can tell about them tells us about what life was like back in the days of the Titanic in 1912. One aspect that I'm curious about in terms of historical perspective is that in this series, we'll have recipe spotlights where you have a food or drink that you pair with a particular person or a group of people. How do you think researching the food and drink consumed in the Titanic gave you insight into what it was like on the ship? And I I should mention a little bit more what I mean by this question. I had a guest a long time ago on this podcast who looked at culinary history. He would see what ancient Romans or medieval people ate and would try to recreate bread recipes from the medieval period or drink spiced wine from the Roman period it helped him to imagine what it would be like to live at that time. And did you feel anything like that of eating or drinking what people would have actually consumed on the ship? Did that do anything for you in that sense? Absolutely. You know, there were so many telltale signs from the research that I went through. And I just mentioned one point a little bit earlier about the draft Munich lager and that Adolfo Selfeld had drank that at lunchtime or he could have. We don't know for sure if he did drink that. But the fact that Adolfo even wrote a letter detailing the whole menu to his wife tells me we're not the first foodies, right? We're not, this is not some new concept that people are um, in love with their foods and they um, look forward to their meals and they, um, you know, make a big deal of them. In fact, you know, the, the Edwardians actually might have celebrated food and dining even more so than we do, certainly much more elaborately but I don't think that's something new to us. Um, we might have, you know, so many food television shows and, um, you know, plenty more recipes to choose from these days. I'm sure we do. But um, 
it was just as important to the Edwardians as it was to us. Were there any recipes that really stuck out to you for any reason? Maybe it was something that sounds really strange because it's not something we do, but you were pleasantly surprised or stuck out for a different reason? Yes, there there definitely was. I'll get to that. But first, you know, I have to say there were so many just wonderful recipes that came out of this collaboration with the different chefs. We spoke with home cooks. You know, we have a, a woman from um, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, uh, Marjorie Beretta. And I remember speaking to Marjorie on the phone about a year ago on a, a cold winter Sunday. And she was so delighted to hear from me and, and tell me about her recipes for things like artichoke bottoms and salmon mousse, things that she had developed into recipes based on the last first class dinner on the Titanic. And she had a dinner party for her friends. And so those recipes or a few of them are in the book. And um, I was just delighted to meet people like Marjorie. Um, I loved the colorful spring pea souffle and spring pea soup. Uh, duo, he calls it the Spring Pea Duo, that Michael Lashowitz, the Chicago chef, he's actually in Winnetka, a suburb of Chicago. Um, he contributed to these lovely recipes that really showcase spring peas well. And uh, as you know, you know, April, was, it was a springtime menu for the most part, or the menus were um, springtime um, menus on the Titanic because of the time of year. So we see, you know, rhubarb and um, spring peas, plenty of them. But uh, I, the reason I love those so much is the bright green color. It's just, they're just spectacular. And um, they just would really add um, an, a great breath of um, fresh spring, fresh spring air to any Titanic party or, um, any kind of uh, meal time for uh, celebrating the the recipes in this book, but if I had to pick one real specific one that really fits the bill with what the way you described it, I would have to say tripe and onions. And not that I love tripe, but <laughs> I um, had never really explored it much, and it was on the the menu in third class. So we really wanted to have a study of tripe. We have several tripe and onion recipes. And by the time I finished talking with the people who were still making the tripe and onions that their grandparents had made in England, Australia, Ireland, you know, not just in the United States, but all over – I actually started to think this is a really neat dish and I loved it when I tried it. You know, I test drove all the recipes and really enjoyed trying all of them, but I was more uh, surprised than any other recipe by how wonderful and lovely the tripe and onions recipe was. And in addition to that, uh, there was one tripe and onions recipe in particular where I actually developed a friendship online with a woman in Johannesburg, South Africa. And her recipe for tripe and onions from her family is um, featured in the book. And her name is Sonia Geyer. And we've become real good friends on Facebook and Instagram because of our connection with the book. And uh, that's one of the neat things about this project. It was an incredible collaboration. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. Something I'm interested in is the all the human stories with the Titanic because it seems like you see the best and the worst of humanity in this episode, yes. which I guess could yes. come out in any disaster. And that's something else you delve into. In terms of the best, if we look at that, sort of the gallantry and the bravery and the face of doom, are there any stories that stick out to you of somebody that was your favorite to research or somebody who most inspired you with their bravery? Well, I was really inspired by so many stories. It was just incredible. The people who put others before them. Um, but the one person I think that stands out the most is someone who consistently helped others. You know, when 9-11 happened and everyone didn't know what to think or um, what direction to go next. 
Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers shared a really personal story with everyone about something his mother said to him. And he wanted it to help people in the face of disaster. And she said to him, Fred, when there's a disaster, always look for the helpers. There will always be people helping. And and there truly were in this case. And one of those was the first person who comes to my mind when I think of that is Margaret Brown or Molly Brown. We know her today in popular culture as the unsinkable Molly Brown. It's kind of her um, moniker or the, you know, the way people kind of think of her. Um, and it's because, mainly because of the reputation she built for herself of always thinking for others. Even when fear was right in her face, she thought of things like encouraging her, um, the women in her lifeboat to row to keep warm. You know, a little thing like that. How many people would be thinking about that, that when their own life was in danger? Um, once aboard the Carpathia in the wee hours of the morning of April 15th, you know, we hear stories of her getting people together and galvanizing people to honor Captain Rostron of the Carpathia, who went through a very dangerous uh, field of icebergs to get to the Titanic survivors. So I'm inspired incredibly by so many of these people. They they really were the wind beneath my wings through an incredible year for me personally. But I, if I had to pick one person to tell you about right now, it would be Molly Brown. And another reason I like history is there's plenty of negative case studies of what not to do. And I'm sure there's plenty of those people on the Titanic as well. Who stuck out to you on the other extreme of someone that you dislike the most in your research? Well, by far, the one person who stuck out as a, a nasty scoundrel <laughs> um, was someone who was on board the Titanic. And the reason he was on board the Titanic was quite ironic when you consider his fate. Um, he was traveling back home. His farm in Kentucky was said to be uh, affected by some severe flooding. And he was coming back from a trip to Germany. The reason why he went to Germany is because he had recently inherited an estate from a widow that he had befriended. Um, and her name was Frau Hasse. And somehow he had, um, Dr. Morawak is his name, somehow Dr. Morawak, who was known for you know flirting and encouraging the, the young single ladies on the ship to spend time with him and commit to more time at once they reached New York. Somehow he had um, gotten Frau Hasse to turn over her whole life estate to him. They weren't even married and they um, somehow became friends through their travels. She came and stayed with him for a while in the United States. She was from Germany and she she inherit he inherited her entire estate. So he was going to Germany to see what he could do with this villa. And, you know, there had to be lawyers involved because Frau Hasse had children and grandchildren and all sorts of people that claimed that it was their family estate. Well, the newspaper stories that I saw about this man, Dr. Morawak, um, he was known for inventing a tool for removing cataracts. Uh, several reports claimed that this was not the first time that he did this, that he had, you know, done this before with other widows. And so to me, you know, he um, definitely stuck out as someone um, a bit nefarious compared to some of the heroes like Molly Brown. Yeah. And we're going to see much more of Dr. Morawak and Molly Brown in future episodes. So if people are interested, we'll get way more into their story and probably about two dozen other stories like that where you really see the full spectrum of humanity for good and for bad when they're thrown into such an extreme situation. All right. Thank you for uh, giving us that setup. In the next several episodes, we're going to be looking at the, all the different types of people who are on the Titanic, various professions, people from various backgrounds, from third class to first class. And in the next episode, we're going to kick off this series by looking at the baker. See you there. Thanks for listening to The Last Night on the Titanic podcast. To listen to all the episodes in the series, 
go to last night on the titanicpodcast.com. There you also find show notes, biographical profiles of the passengers and crew on the Titanic, and recipes for all the recipe spotlights that we do in the series. One last thing, if you like the show, please rate and review it on the podcast listener of your choice. Thanks again for listening and see you next time.